Next, we will dive further into what a career in wealth looks like with our next panel. Panelists will share what courses are required to qualify for careers in wealth and speak to their experiences, finding mentors and sponsors. This panel will provide an inside look at a typical day on the job. The panelists will highlight why wealth management is an attractive career opportunity for women. I would like to start by introducing today's moderator of the panel, Andrea Linger, Vice President, Practice Management and Head of the Women Canadian Advisors Network at Raymond James. Andrea began her career in the financial services industry in 2010 and joined Raymond James in 2011. During her time at Raymond James, she has grown her career, taken on new roles and increasing responsibilities first with an advisory team, and then in the practice management department. As vice president of practice management, Andrea is responsible for managing, facilitating, and designing programs to improve the profitability and growth of our financial investment advisors across Canada. She is directly responsible for the delivery of various practice management programs, facilitating new advisor training and succession planning programs. Andrea, thank you for being with us uh, today. And thank you to Raymond James for your support of today's event. I will turn the spotlight over to you and our first panel. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Laura. That is, uh, it's a mouthful for a title. I know that much. <laughs> uh, you know, Raymond James, our vision is to be a financial services firm as unique as the people that we serve. You're transforming lives, businesses, and communities through the power of personal relationships and professional advice. We have a long history uh, in the financial services industry and have grown to include over 3,100 branches worldwide with over 8,400 advisors and more than 18,900 associates working to ensure that our clients' needs come first. We were the recipient of the 2021 and prior years, uh, Best Workplace in Financial Services and the Best Workplace for Women, Inclusion, Mental Wellness, and for Giving Back, as well as we were recognized on the Forbes list of the world's best employers in 2021. We have many different career opportunities, which I'm excited to hear about um, and in further panels in a wide range of departments, which is why we enjoy sponsoring organizations like WCM and events such as this so that we can network with the up and coming talent such as yourselves. So let's dive into this panel discussion today. And I would really love for all of our panelists to introduce themselves. And we're gonna go in alphabetical order because that's the easiest way for me to do this. So uh, can we get Amy Lee to please introduce your name, what you do and the firm that you work with? Sure, thank you again. And I'm happy to be here today. My name is on my screen, so I guess everybody can read it. It's Amy Lee. I'm vice president of our training and practice excellence team uh, within Scotia Wealth Management at Scotia Bank. Thank you. Emery. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Um, as, as, as well, my name's on the screen. I'm Anne-Marie Sirio, and I'm Vice President and Director responsible for Client Experience and Sales Strategy at TD Asset Management. Brianne. Hi, everyone. I am Brianne Gardner. I am Financial Advisor at Velocity Investment Partners within Raymond James. And Daniela. Hi everyone, I'm Daniela Jaramillo. I am a district vice president at Manual Life Investment Management. Um, and in my role, I'm responsible for uh, the maintenance and growth of a, of a territory in Western Canada in Vancouver. Fabulous, and Nadesh. Hi, I'm Nadesh Koskam, Senior Financial Consultant at IG Wealth Management. Fabulous, thank you so much, ladies. So now let's do a little bit of a bit of a deeper dive into what you do in your role, why you love it, and how long have you been in the wealth uh, management sphere? So again, let's start with Amy. Uh, thanks, Andrea. So within, I guess, financial services, I've been about 18 years of experience in a variety of roles. Uh, within my role today, responsible for driving uh, growth and productivity, similar to you, Andrea, but uh, 
across Scotia Wealth Management um, and in our infield teams and leaders. And Scotia Wealth Management includes our Scotia McLeod division, which is our full service. Uh, also our private banking, our private investment council business, as well as Scotia Trust. So really excited. And why do I love it? I love it because uh, I get to be around a lot of interesting people. I get to be deep dive and work with people in the field and head office. So it's really exciting to see some of the things that you do come to life um, and to help uh, help the, the people in the field do a better job at their businesses. So excited about that. And what about you, Amory? What do you love about Thank your job? You. So <laughs> lots of things. I mean, I've, I've actually been in, in financial and professional services for, or let's just say, well over 20 years, um, about 15 of those within wealth. So in my current role, um, I, as I mentioned, oversee client experience and sales strategy. That's for the institutional business. So this really involves so many, so many different facets. I lead the development of strategic priorities and then all the programs that impact ultimately impact client experience from marketing, communications, thought leadership, event programs, you know, critical communications around navigating, you know, sensitive situations like the one we're in today with the Ukraine and Russia and leading client experience research. But my role, or actually my experience within wealth has been, been quite varied, uh, which really speaks to the breadth of opportunities available within wealth. So in my early days, I actually managed investments and group plans for high net worth and commercial banking clients. I also worked in divisional and corporate offices as sort of the gatekeeper between um, investment or money in groups and, and the branches to enable them to navigate those conversations with retail clients. I led global and uh, global marketing communications for TD Securities, which is the institutional capital markets business within TD. And then for the last 10 years, I've been with TD Asset Management, um, leading initially leading teams, overseeing client support, sales support, and now much more, much more strategic role. What I really love um, about my role currently and, and prior roles as well is that I love working with really smart, intelligent um, internal stakeholders, uh, the opportunity to lead by influence is something that I'm really passionate about. And then, you know, recognizing we're all in financial services, but at the end of the day, we're all helping to impact wealth uh, within Canada and wealth enables all of us uh, to achieve goals, whatever they may be. So that's, I try to always keep that end goal in mind and that keeps me passionate and, and loving what I do. That sounds like a lot of experience and a lot of different hats that you are. Yeah. <laughs> Rihanna, what about you? Why don't you tell us what being a financial advisor is like for you? Yeah, so um, I am a financial advisor kind of tailored towards high net worth individuals and families. My specialty is really in that long-term investing and comprehensive tax smart wealth management strategies for both successful business owners and that multi-generational family wealth. Um, I act as an kind of like an integrated life or wealth coach for my clients as well. So providing personalized advice on really every aspect of my client's financial well-being. So what do I love most about what I do? Um, as much as I'm passionate about investing, uh, I care deeply about my clients. I take a personal interest in their lives. Um, their goals, their aspirations. And at the end of the day, really markets aside, it's all about my clients. Um, so I've only been in the wealth management side uh, for seven years, but I have a lot more years to go. Yes, you do. <laughs> Danielle. So I've been in um, wealth management for about 13 years, and I actually started on the advisory side um, where Brianna is. So I spent the first six years there and made a switch into sales distribution. And I mean, good on all of you for being here today, because I didn't even know my job existed till I was about three years in the industry. So you're all already three years ahead of me. <laughs> um, so I've been at Manulife for the last four years. And I lead a team uh, responsible, like I said, for the maintenance and growth of, of the top producing territory in Canada. And some things I really love about my job are, um, firstly, it's a team of highly motivated people. So in sales, you'll find um, people who are really internally motivated. And I really, I respect that. Um, they're always trying to, to reach higher, achieve more. And something else I really like, which I don't know, as women, we tend to not talk about it too much. Uh, compensation's good. We get paid really well. 
Uh, and if you know where you want to go, you can get there. Car career progression is very, uh, very straightforward. There are milestones, there are training programs, and there's help along the way to help you reach those milestones. Um, and I guess for this, for this format, it's also really important to say that in a largely male-dominated industry, I've found some great female leaders. Like my boss is a woman. Her boss is a woman, Catherine, I, but I guess you heard from her, she just got promoted. So she might not be my direct two degrees away from separation anymore. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've found some great, uh, great inspirational uh, female and, and male leaders. That's fantastic. Nadesh, what about you? Um, so I've been with IG Wealth Management in the wealth space for the last 10 years now. I started as a, just a consultant and I work with Canadians work with uh, the Canadian families helping build their intergenerational wealth. And then as well, um, my role has two sides. I'm also a division director. So I lead a division of consultants and I uh, recruit and train and develop them. And so I'll sit in on client meetings with them, support them on client cases. If, um, if they need some help with strategies, I mean, two, three, sometimes four heads are better than one. And then um, as well with uh, growing their business, just some marketing ideas and how I can support them and coaching and mentoring. So I really like that aspect of my job, but the side I'm probably more passionate about is the client facing. I, I love similar to what Brianne said. Um, I love that your clients become your friends. You get so ingrained in their lives and you get to find out things first. They're, they may be trying for a baby or they are pregnant, but on the, flip side you do also get the the tougher conversations you know you may be the first to find out of a cancer diagnosis but at least you know you did the right steps and you put the critical illness insurance in place so that mm -hmm. they're going to be okay and their family won't be derailed by a major um life event like that fabulous so you know what let's switch gears just a little bit we're going to have some specific questions i'm going to ask um each of you uh so Along the way, Daniela, did you have mentors or sponsors that helped you early on in your career? I did actually, and I think that's really important. Um, there's more emphasis on it now than when I was coming along. So I ended up getting some mentors outside of the organizations I was with. Um, and there are good and bad things about that because of course they don't have um, the knowledge, the internal knowledge, but then they also can give you an outside perspective. Uh, so I had two mentors, and I think what's what's more important is getting a sponsor or a champion. So a mentor is kind of given to you, or you're assigned, or like some someone's just being nice type of thing. But a sponsor or a champion will really uh, go the extra mile for you and advocate for you. So I think uh, the most important thing to do when you have a mentor is turn them into a sponsor. Uh, and it's it has to be a two-way relationship. It can't be an all-take relationship. So, for example, something I did early on was one of my mentors was involved with a, a charity, an organization. So I volunteered there to spend more time with her and to show her what I could do and how how I could stand out from, from the crowd. So I ended up actually gaining her uh, sponsorship. And she ended up offering me a job at one point and we found out it wasn't a right fit for me. But then at that juncture in my life, she ended up helping me negotiate my next contract. So, um, I mean, that was, that was huge for me and I wasn't uh, like paired up with a mentor early on. So I would definitely encourage everyone to, to find a mentor if you don't already have one and really uh, build that relationship as much as you can. Yeah, I really agree with that. Uh, sponsors and mentors are important. The sponsors being the, the most important for sure. Uh, Amy, what about you? Um, have you had a mentor or sponsor that helped you in your career? Yeah, maybe I'll just echo or just add to what Daniela was saying too. Um, I think the best way that someone actually helped me uh, better understand the difference between a mentor, a sponsor, or even a coach is described as a coach talks to you a mentor talks with you and a sponsor talks about you. So I thought that actually summarized it very well for me. And I think it's equally important to, to surround yourself with a small network of mentors, because those are the types of people that you can lean in, get some different perspectives, 
uh, tell you kind of the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, but that's not what you want your sponsor to do. <laughs> you want your sponsor to only tell the good uh, and to help advocate for you. And I agree, like more important than a mentor is to get a sponsor, but they both play equally different uh, and important roles within your career. And you're going to need both of them. Um, and for everybody who has a chance, I would definitely recommend um, online searching Carla Harris. So she is phenomenal. She is probably the one person I, I probably watch all her videos. She's the, the vice chairman, senior client advisor, and I think she has a number of titles. Let me just make sure I get this right. And managing director at Morgan Stanley. And during President Obama's term, she, she also advised him and was on um, was appointed the chairperson of their National Women's Business Council. So she has a ton of experience in this. And she speaks to performance and relationship currency. And at some point in your career, you realize that your performance currency will diminish over time because everybody expects you to deliver at a certain level, right? A lot of us are top performers. We understand that. So you, you, you are giving them what they already expect of you. And that's where your relationship currency has to kick in um, about who you know um, and not necessarily if they, uh, whether or not you're liked, but that you're known. And that's really important uh, as, you, as your ability to ascend really um, rests on those that you influence in those relationships. So definitely that's a piece of advice that I would give to all of you today. Thank you, Amy. So we have a lot to cover here in a very short period of time. So um, Brianne, could you give us a really kind of succinct view of what it is that you actually do in a day? Yeah, um, I mean, the great thing about what I do is that no two days are the same. Every day is different. Um, which is, I also love that too. <laughs> it always keeps me on my toes, um, always keeps me wanting to strive for more. Um, and I don't kind of get in a settled pattern. Um, so I could be, you know, some things about what a financial advisor does in a typical day could include investment portfolio management. So researching, um, trading, rebalancing portfolios, um, you know, new, putting new money to work for prospects, meeting with fund managers. Um, you know, I used to meet with Danielle all the time. Um, and she's going to say maybe buying fund. some Manulife funds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, meeting with RJ analysts, uh, prospecting is a big part of our business, right? We need to keep clients coming in, um, new money coming in. That's how we grow as a team and as a business and a firm. So meeting with centers of influences, whether that's accountants, lawyers, um, financial planners, going to networking events, lunch and learns, uh, you know, sometimes golfing um, or things that I'm passionate about. I know Dan um, you know, also mentioned charitable work um, can be a good way to do that, too. And then a big part of what we do is servicing our existing clients. Um, so that's portfolio reviews, whether they're semi-annual or quarterly um, responding to emails, calls, uh, Zoom meetings, lunches, and then there's the paperwork behind the scenes that all happens. Um, and then a lot of the stuff that I'm really passionate about is the financial and estate planning. So doing financial plans for all of our clients and helping them kind of map out that roadmap to their goals and, you know, figuring out where they are now, where they want to be, what that will look like in retirement or for their estate or for their family. Um, working with our in-house planners at Raymond James and doing fact finds and insurance policies, reviewing wills. So as I mentioned, every day is different. No two days are the same. Um, you know, definitely we're up early. Um, if East Coast time, um, let's just say, you know, in the morning, I'd be waking up at around seven, reading articles, news, see what's happening, um, reviewing emails after that. Maybe every morning at 8.30, we have a team meeting. So through COVID, uh, everyone was working remote or at home. So it was nice to kind of get the team together, quick little powwow, talk about our tasks or follow up or what we had to do that day for clients and for um, the business. Nine o'clock, check ingoing, outgoing transactions. I look at, you know, do we have new money coming in? Do we need to put it to work? Any outgoing money? 9.30, markets open check how things are going. Um, it sounds like you have a very busy day. <laughs> yeah, very busy. <laughs> so it's like every day, you know, it's definitely very busy. There's lots of clients, um, prospecting, social media, marketing, 
um, responding to emails, uh, dinners and prospects. So it is uh, a little bit of everything. And uh, yeah, it, it can start as early as, you know, 6, 6.30, start as late as 8. We do have a lot of flexibility in our role, which is also great. So if you do have something that comes up, uh, you know, you can take that time and put it in your schedule and say, okay, I do, you know, after markets close, I can go and run to this appointment. I can go let my dog out. Um, <laughs> and then if I have to go back to a 6 p.m. client dinner, then I can. So I think that's also really great for this role for women is that it does allow us to have flexibility. Um, and even if you do have children um, down the road, it allows you to kind of have that work-life balance too. Nadesh, what about you? Did, did, I mean, Brianne's given a pretty comprehensive overview of what you do as a financial advisor in a day, but is there anything different in your day that, um, that you find? No, I think Brianna and I's roles are, are very similar. We do a lot of the same things during the day, but every day is a lot of talking. I'm always uh, client facing, always talking to clients. You know, I have a really great team behind me that does a lot of the back stuff, the the admins, we have some really great planning software. Um, we just got it a year ago and it's really taken a, a lot of the load off of um, me on the planning side, which allows me to be more client facing. And that client facing part is very important. Uh, clients are their own worst enemy. They will, finances are very emotional. We all know this and are a big part of our role is talking them off of that ledge and making sure that they don't make a decision that will have devastating uh, Im implications to their financial plan. So depending on what the markets are doing that day, it could be a heavy talking people off the ledge type of day, or it could be just checking in with them and seeing how they're doing, especially during the pandemic. I find myself just picking up the phone and calling clients I haven't spoken to in a while and just seeing how they are. And I think people appreciate that. I mean, we're really tired of Zoom calls and being trapped in our four walls by ourselves. And, um, as a, a financial planner too, you do have your own business and your block of clients. So I do spend part of my day researching the business. Where do I want to see the business in five, 10, 15 years? What's my succession plan? And should I be adding new team members to it? What's our marketing strategy? So I like that I get to be, not only do I have to focus on financial stuff, but I get to be creative in the business and, um, and grow it and develop it and really make it what I want, want it to be. Now, I know we're getting close to the end of our session, and I know that we had many, many questions on our list. Uh, Anne-Marie, what I would really love for you to share right now is your one piece of advice for those that are considering a career in wealth. Um, you know, what did you wish you knew when you were in university? Absolutely. Well, um, university seems like a long time ago, uh, but there, I would say there's just there's so much advice. It's hard to drill it down to one. But I think I mean, I feel like the wealth industry, including capital markets, is is a bit of a hidden gem. To be honest, I wish first and foremost that I knew about it sooner. Uh, when I graduated, most of the opportunities uh, were in other industries. And when I thought of TD, I thought of more traditional banking. And uh, so awareness is key. And then even if you are aware of it, um, you know, be you know, rest assured that there's a myriad of opportunities. So don't make any assumptions about the types of roles. I would say, um, you know, get out there, talk to people, make connections, do your research and don't underestimate yourself by any means. And don't wait for a job posting um, or a position to be available to make those connections because people are really open to having those conversations as you try to discover where you might uh, fit best. Um, and so, and, and the point about assumptions is really key because, you know, it, it's wealth at the end of the day and it's financial, but in addition to be a, being a very quantitative um, type setting, it's very qualitative in nature. It's a lot of storytelling and educating and a lot of relationship building. So um, there really is something for everyone. So I, I would just say, keep, keep all of that in mind as, you, as you're moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. I knew most people I talked to have fallen into this industry <laughs> um, and didn't really Fine. even know it existed. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. I know so I've everyone has had, so everyone has a real uh, lead in just by being on this call, really. 
Uh, so, you know, we are almost out of time here, but I do want to have time for uh, some questions because we do have some coming in. So just a reminder to all the participants, uh, please put your questions into the chat uh, so that we can um, get them answered for you. We do have one here that says, as a young woman, where is a good place to start after university? Uh, how do I start to establish credibility in the industry? Who would like to take that question? And just or briefly touch. <laughs> I actually, when I first finished um, school and was looking, I the the way I got in was actually through Women in Capital Markets when they used to host a networking thing, and I didn't know <coughs> about all the different options there were. But I went and um, met with, and I volunteered, and I was like, I can give my time. I can do this. I started with the Women in Capital Markets. Um, golf tournament because I knew a lot about golf and I was like I'll take that on I will get involved and then I met so many amazing people across uh, Canada and honestly the networking and the connections that I made that's kind of what, how I learned about the different areas within um, women within capital markets and wealth management. Um, Maybe I'll echo that too. Um, yeah. The wealth management industry even though it's very big it's actually, everybody kind of knows each other, like just what Brienne said, even though it's across the country, it's very interesting to see how you can actually um, meet and network um, in your local markets and nationally, because a lot of the people know each other in the industry. So a lot of transferable ways to get involved. Um, and just uh, what Anne-Marie said too, is just get out there and just try a few things because you'll realize it's not going to be the path that you think, and it's going to be very creative how you get there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and I think the big thing, too, is there's so many different avenues within wealth. You know, we have lawyers, we have accountants, we have analysts, you know, like there's there's so many different career paths within and underneath that umbrella of wealth. Um, what, what resources would you recommend to university students to build their skills and knowledge for this industry? Danielle? I can start with this one. Take the Canadian Securities course. Yep. <laughs> Just now sign up. It's, it's, I mean, I don't want to say it's easy, but it's, it's easy to do concurrently with something else. Yes, absolutely. Um, what about, uh, so, I mean, not only CSC, we got the CPH that you got to take to the conducts and practices. You will learn about the wealth managers, management industry. We have a lot of acronyms for everything. Um, what else do we have here in questions? So how would you suggest reaching out to professionals in the industry to build a relationship with them and learn, learn more? Who would like to take that one? Nadej, Amy? I could take that one. Okay. Um, LinkedIn's a really great resource. Just I've had lots of people uh, reach out to me LinkedIn and just want to ask questions. And I've always got time to talk about uh, to talk about this industry and someone that wants to get involved. So it's a really great resource. Oh, this is a great question. Uh, if you had two candidates, one who studied finance and one who studied psychology or a less technical degree, what would be the decisive factors that would lead you to pick the second candidate? Anne-Marie, do you have an answer for that one? I, I, we're faced with that very often, um, actually, and, and a lot of it goes beyond, um, beyond the educational background and its cultural fit. So if you can demonstrate as well that you know, your, your values align with the organization and that I think someone touched on it earlier about being passionate, um, then that would go beyond that. I mean, there's usually you know, some minimum requirements that, that we need and, and some of those can be achieved along the way, but I would say cultural fit and passion for me would be the, the, the things that would stand out that I would choose that individual over the other. Can I answer that one as well? Yes, absolutely, Danielle. <laughs> so I think that uh, passion and grit go a longer way. If you can identify someone who is willing to put in the work, I would pick that individual over someone who knows more. Yeah. Um, Tec technical skills can be taught. Mm -hmm. You can learn the technical <laughs> skills. You can't teach the, the, uh, the soft skills sometimes. Mm -hmm. And Especially on the wealth management right. industry, it can be a little overwhelming, but... Yeah. Um, Believe me, like I, I took psychology, but <laughs> along the way, I had to do the Canadian securities course. I did, um, I signed up for the CFA program, big part of it. 
And, um, but you can, you can learn the markets, um, the soft skills and the time you put in the hard work. That's something you have to do on your own and you need to find it within yourself. Yeah. Andrea, just to touch on, cause this sort of addresses that plus one of the other questions. I, mm -hmm. I mean, I think how you come across in these interviews, how you communicate clearly mm -hmm. will set you apart. And, and we've done at TD, we've done a lot of work with the Humphrey group in terms of, you know, leadership presence, leader script. Um, and I would urge people to look into that type of information as well. In addition to, to things that are really specific to the, to the industry, but just leadership principles in general, how to communicate, how to, how to, how to, you know, um, set yourself apart from others. That would be something I would invest some time in as well ahead of these conversations and just ahead of the networking. Cause even every networking conversation, every email you send um, is a communication that you can come across as a leader or not. So uh, it's an opportunity. I could not agree with you more. I've, take, I've done the Humphrey Group's Taking the Stage. Yes. What a fabulous program. I highly recommend every woman take that yeah. course. <laughs> yeah, agreed. Yeah, it's and very, just very probably great. to add to that too is the, like, right now we're going through like, you know, hopefully coming out of this pandemic, but resilience, mm -hmm. uh, the ability for you to act on your feet or, sh or pivot is also very interesting mm -hmm. for, uh, for us in, in, in interviews to see how you can actually adapt in different situations. Because in an interview, sometimes you're not just looking for one role. You could have multiple roles that you're looking for candidates. So it's very good to see the just how much you can be resilient or dynamic in certain situations. <laughs> So we have time for a couple more questions here. So as a master student with no prior experience in the wealth industry, how easy is it to get into a role in the industry and what are the skills required for a role? Who would like to tackle this one? Well, I can start because that was me. <laughs> hey, <good. laughs> um, my undergrad was in marketing. Uh, I did my BCom in marketing and I had no finance experience. Um, and then I did my MBA and then I interned for a wealth management firm and I was like, this is what I want to do. This is, you know, I get to put all my skills of sales, marketing, and then a passion for client servicing and understanding finances to work. And so, yeah, doing kind of the Canadian securities course, the CPH, which we had talked about, um, but really allowing you to go different routes within wealth management, right? You can go the financial planning route, you can get your CFP, you can go the analyst route, you can get your CFA or CIM. Um, so you're not narrowed to just one straight path up. You can branch out, you can go in insurance, you can go, you know, there's so many tax planning, you can go, um, it doesn't, different courses will open the doors, but at the basic, as we kind of talked about before, yeah, getting your CSC and CPH. Um, can definitely help you um, there. But I started out as an assistant, unlicensed, did my, my courses, got licensed, became an associate, became an associate advisor, became an advisor, and now I have my own business. So you can work your way up with no, no experience at all. But, um, and then, yeah, just the, what we talked about earlier, the work ethic and um, being passionate about what you do. Uh, I think, and having the right attitude, um, a lot of those other skills can be taught. So this is the last question. I think this is a really important one to end on here. So um, if you, if any of you have any children, I'd like to know if you find it difficult having children when you have a job within the wealth management industry. So who would like to take that on the panel? I think having children in general is difficult. Regardless <laughs> I would agree with where you. you are. <laughs> <laughs> I have really little children and I actually, it has its challenges as there are some things, you know, I used to do after work things and now I don't, I want to get home and I want to hang out with my little people because they're only up till 730. But um, I do have lots of flexibility to be able to take time away if, you know, daycare's closed that day or one of them sick to just take the day off. You know, I can answer a few emails, but my team can um, assist with running the business for the day. So I really, really like the flexibility. I like the fact that I'm going to be able to, you know, go to things in the middle of the afternoon, uh, take whatever holidays that I want because it's my choice. So I think it's a great business to be a parent in. And my site's a little bit different on sales distribution. I would second that. I have, I have a very young child and, um, it's, it's been great. Like I can, I can schedule my meetings around uh, her schedule as well. 
And yeah, I mean, I'll do some evening events, but I'll be here other evenings. So I think it's a, it helps a lot to have a supportive partner who's also willing to take on a lot of work. Uh, but it is definitely doable and it's rewarding to have both. Like I don't, I wouldn't have it any other way. I completely agree. I've got four kids, so I totally get it. You know, it's a juggling act, but the flexibility is amazing in this career. Well, ladies, I just want to thank you so much for all of your insights. Um, you know, I think this is important for uh, more students and university students to really understand uh, what this industry has to offer. Uh, and I, again, thank you so much to Anne-Marie, Amy, Daniela, uh, Nadej, and Brianne for sharing your insights and your thoughts on um, what it means to have a career in the wealth management uh, sphere. So thank you again very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Andrea. Thanks.